up to the recorder. All right. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Wa ba'd. So today's topic is going to be um, a topic on a contemporary issue, and that is specifically on cryptocurrency. Um, and we're going to be talking about Bitcoin, which is one of the first cryptocurrencies or decentralized cryptocurrencies that was formed. Um, and this is a topic that people, a lot of people have been asking about. Uh, but I just want to get a quick, you know, uh, gauge of the audience. How many of you are familiar with cryptocurrency? Okay. So quite a few people, especially on the men's side. Um, how many of you feel that you really understand how cryptocurrency works very well? Almost nobody. Okay, that's good. So that's, inshallah, what we're going to try to do. But this program today, inshallah, it's not just about the question, is Bitcoin halal? So this is the first question that many people will be asking. And what's happened is, since 2017, this is a common question that Muslim scholars are getting. Is Bitcoin halal or is Bitcoin haram? And I don't simply want to give an answer to that. It's not a yes or no answer. It's not a, it's a halal or it's a haram question, you know, answer. But instead in this session, we want to see how a Muslim scholar or Muslim scholars try to process issues which they've never come across before. And so this is not just going to be giving you an answer about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. It's going to teach you something about how Islamic law functions, how it's more complex than many people actually think, and what are some mistakes that people may make along the way because they don't have a good understanding of, of how the Sharia or how Islamic law is supposed to be processed. So we're going to do that in this exercise while looking at cryptocurrency as an example of how a new issue like this should be processed because there's many new issues coming out. There is cloning, there is stem cell research, uh, there so many issues in biomedical ethics, so many issues in economics, this being one of them. There's issues in morality, there's issues in, uh, you know, so many things that we've never seen before. You know, what are you going to do when, uh, you know, which direction do you pray with if you're in outer space and, you know, all these things which you won't find a, an answer from a scholar that lived in the 19th century or maybe even in the 20th century because they never faced these issues. So there's a way to process these things. So I want to uh, talk about cryptocurrency, but at the same time, kind of make you understand the process through which Muslim scholars are supposed to be going through or are going through to understand this. And then you maybe will appreciate better Islamic law. And also you'll appreciate why it takes some time before a clear answers are formulated. And sometimes, you know, people may jump the gun and then modify their fatwa later on because they understood things in a different light afterwards. So that's what we're going to try to do today. So the first question is, is Bitcoin halal? So when somebody asks a Muslim scholar this question, the first thought of a Muslim scholar in their mind is going to be to question the question that was asked. That's the first thing that they're supposed to do. And we're trained that way, and rightfully so. So what kind of questions are we going to ask as scholars when this person asks the question about whether Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is halal? The first question we ask is what caused this person to ask this question? What is the reason why they asked this question? Like what's the motive behind asking it? That's very important to understand before you can give that person an answer. The second question that we're going to ask is what exactly is Bitcoin, right? And how does it work? Somebody asks, you know, is it halal? So, okay, well, what exactly is it? Do I fully understand exactly how it works and how it functions? And then the third question they're going to ask is once we have a good understanding, are there elements that we know already in the principles of Islamic law that we can apply to say that there are some haram elements or forbidden elements inside this thing that the person is asking? And of course, we're going to see how this person is going to use that as well. So this is what goes through a scholar's mind, okay? And they ask more questions than this. I'm just summarizing. Uh, now, there are some mistakes. Some mistakes can be made when giving an answer to a question on Islamic law or about the Sharia for a number of reasons. Common mistake number one is that the scholar or the person being asked does not understand the motive of the person. 
And it's very important to answer according to the motive. So I'll give you an example. One of the great companions, the scholars among the companions, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was asked by a person. He says, if somebody commits murder in Islam, and then they ask Allah for forgiveness, can Allah forgive them? And he said, no. So his students were shocked. And they, after the guy left, they said, how can you say that? You know, Imam, we learn in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive any other sins besides associating partners with Allah. Why did you say that? He said, because I saw in this guy's, in this, in this guy's eyes evil. What did that mean? Meaning this guy was not asking me a question because he wanted to know the theoretical answer in Islam. This guy wanted to kill someone. And he asked me the question with the motive that if I say yes, you know, if you ask Allah sincerely, then Allah will forgive you. The guy will go and kill someone. And I could see it in his eyes. Therefore, I gave him an answer that was appropriate for his circumstance because of the dire consequences that would result. So understanding the motive of the question is really important as well. And when it comes to cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and things like that, understanding the motive of why people are asking this question is extremely important. So one question we have to ask is that Bitcoin was introduced in January of 2009. You ask any Muslim scholars, nobody was asked in 2009 about Bitcoin, 2010, 2011, 2012, almost nobody is asking. All the questions come in in 2017. Why in 2017? Because in, in the beginning of 2017, Bitcoin was valued at $1,000. One Bitcoin was $1,000. By the end, it jumped to $11,000. So it became something that people wanted to trade speculatively on, right? So that's, people wanted to just make some money off of it. That's why it all of a sudden became very popular. So the question is not so much about the technology, what are the pros and the cons of the technology nowadays. The question why many people are asking about Bitcoin specifically is because they see it as a way to make some money quick and a lot of money potentially, right? And there's a lot of people who made a lot of money. And there's a lot of people who lost a lot of money. So that's reason number one. And I think in America, most people are asking the question due to, you know, investing or speculation on the currency trading. The second type of people who ask the question are people who live in countries, primarily Muslim predominant countries, which are really at the, the cutting edge of trying to develop an alternative Islamic finance product, right? or an Islamic economy that is closer to Sharia standards than, than anywhere else. An example of that would be like Malaysia. Right? So when people ask the same question in Malaysia, they're not just interested in making a trade. They're asking because this Islamic finance industry is booming in certain countries and people are trying to come up with innovative ways to develop something which would be a currency that is closer to being in line with Islamic principles. And this is something which many people are interested in. They're interested in blockchain technology and all of that. They'd rather have something that's either tied to gold or not so much riba-based, interest-based type currency. So there's two different motives. The motive of the average, I would say, the average American is usually in the first category, right? So understanding the motive is going to help you give the answer in terms of what exactly do you intend to do with your answer of is Bitcoin halal or haram? So we have to understand that clearly. The second common mistake is um, allowing the questioner to explain how something works. And this is something which scholars may make a mistake in. So someone will come to someone, who, like a scholar for example, who's never heard of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And the person will ask, is it halal? And they'll say, okay, well, why don't you tell me how it works? So they say, well, it's the electronic system where you can send this, to, uh, you send money to another person and this and that. And then the way the person will explain it, based upon the explanation of that person, the scholar will give an answer. But that person may not be giving an accurate explanation of that thing. And that's a common mistake that happens, right? So that's one issue. And another issue in this field is if the scholar who's trying to un you know, give an answer, they, they try to understand some new technology, whether it's cloning or cryptocurrency or whatever it is, but they don't fully understand how it functions. Because 
it's not so much their field or they've read a paper on it, there's some debate on it, and they read the wrong paper or they read the wrong papers or read the wrong research, it's going to lead them to give an incorrect answer on that. And then you may end up finding that they change their position several years later because they have a different understanding of it. So that's problem or mistake number two. That's very common. Mistake number three is that the scholar may not understand the underlying philosophy of the Islamic economic principles um, that they were taught in their seminary education. Okay, now I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, criticize uh, scholars and their education, but the reality is if you ask the average person who's graduating from a Muslim seminary, you say, when, the way that you studied wudu, the way that you studied salah, the way that you studied fasting in Ramadan, the way that you study all these rules, how, how much depth in depth did you go into the economic parts of studying the hadith and the verses of the Quran and the principles and fiqh and how well were you able to understand that in light of modern economic practices. And I think many scholars would honestly tell you that that's not something that we're very strong in because our curriculum is not very strong in that either. Right? And that's unfortunately one of the problems where it becomes difficult for asking an average person who's considered to be a sheikh or an imam or whatever it is, they have a seminary education, they have a degree in Islamic law and sharia, but they may not be very strong either in understanding the principles or applying the principles to modern day economic realities because that's not their field and they didn't specialize in that really. So that's problem uh, number three. Okay, so these are some common mistakes that are made. And you have to understand that, and you have to understand that may be something that can potentially change things, okay? So with that said, let's move on to principles. So a scholar gets asked a question, is Bitcoin halal, is Bitcoin haram, or whatever it is. The first thing is they go back to certain, Isla uh, econo or certain Islamic principles, uh, principles in Islamic law. <clears throat> One of the principles in Islamic law, which maybe many Muslims don't know, uh, but it's very important to know is that the default in Sharia, the default is that everything is halal unless it can be proven to be haram. Some people think the opposite actually, right? Because they feel like everything is made haram until we can prove it's halal. Maybe that you feel that way because of the attitude of some people or certain discussions you had. Or maybe you always want to just do haram things and that's why it feels that way. Whatever reason it is, you may feel that way. But the actual principle that is agreed upon by all Muslim scholars, there's no debate about this, all right? That pretty much in everything, for the most part, is that the default position of something new is that it's halal unless you can prove that it's haram. You don't have to prove that it's halal. You have to prove that it's haram in order for it to be haram or prohibited in Islam. Uh, one, ex just give you a random example, you know. Uh, anyone been to an oxygen bar? It's not a bar, okay? So it's, you know, be like, astaghfirullah. You think I'm gonna raise my hand in the masjid that I went to a bar? An oxygen bar is where you just inhale oxygen. It's like flavored oxygen. Okay, has anyone seen an oxygen bar? Has anyone seen flavored oxygen? A few, a few people. So this is like, this is a pretty, it's not a new trend really. It's been around for like uh, over a decade, maybe 15 years or 20 years now. There are, there are bars, they don't sell alcohol at all. They're called oxygen bars. You go in there, you put on a little mask or you put something over your mouth and you inhale flavored oxygen. Now this is not something that people used to do in the past, right? <laughs> Inhaling oxygen and you know, this is like something you sit down and you do. But there's oxygen bars and they're in many different places and people inhale that. So the first time someone comes across this and you say, hey, is that halal? The word, it's a bar, <laughs> you know, how can you go into a bar? Well, the bar's not serving alcohol, number one. Number two, no one has ever inhaled oxygen before. So this is a question that no one has you know, really come across before. A scholar would never have come across this. So, but the first thing in their mind is not, don't go there until we can prove that it's halal. The first thing in their mind is, this is, should be halal unless we can find something that is haram in it. And that's how they apply the principle. That's how scholars think and they're supposed to think and that's how they're trained. It may not feel that way for some of you depending on where you come from and who you interact with, but that's the reality. That's how every single scholar is trained and no one is going to disagree on this. Right Khalil? This is, this is the principle, right? This is the general principle that we learn in seminaries. So 
That's the way we should be dealing with things. So that's principle number one. So the first thing is when it comes to Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, it's brand new. Before we understand it, we say, okay, this might be just fine. Let's see if we can identify anything clear cut that causes it to be prohibited or, or haram in Islam. So then we have two more principles. All right. The first principle is what this is in kind of an economic transaction when it comes to currency and economics. So in economics, there are two main principles that could make a transaction haram. That's the only thing that can pretty much cause it to be haram. It either has elements of riba, riba is interest, or it has elements of gharar. All right, gharar means something that is, uh, there's uncertainty or a high level of uncertainty in it. Or if something is like, for example, there's unknown, there's, uh, something is uncertain. So if you look at all the rules pertaining to Islamic economics, it's got to have either riba or gharar inside of it in order to be prohibited. Otherwise, most likely, it's going to be considered halal or permissible in Islam. Okay, so I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here because I know this is being recorded. Other people are watching this. Even some scholars are going to be watching this later. So I'm going to do a little bit more detail, so bear with me. So a scholar will go back to his books and they'll open up some of their books on Islamic law, their books of fiqh. And they start to go and say, okay, well, let's look at some of these principles. Let's see how some of these principles apply. So among the principles that they're going to look at, they'll go to a book like this. This is a book called Bidayatul Mujtahid wa Nihayatul Muqtasid by Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd is a famous scholar by the name of Averroes. He's known among non-Muslims in, in universities. He's famous for being a philosopher, translated the works of Aristotle and, you know, not translated, but he commented on the works of Aristotle. But he's also a Muslim jurist. He's a, he's a specialist in Sharia as well. So he has this book. Here's a translation for you. So bear with me, but he kind of goes to the philosophy of how economics works in Islam. So I'm going to give a little bit explanation of this here. He says each transaction between two individuals is an exchange. So what is an exchange? It's when you, when you transact between two individuals, either of corporeal property for corporeal property, meaning an actual object for an object, or of corporeal property and object for a corresponding liability, right? For I'll do some favor to you, or I owe you money or something like that, or of a liability for another liability. So it could be a debt for a debt, or I'll do you a favor and then you do me a favor later. It says each one of these three is either delayed or immediate. So when you trade something, either you do it immediately, you trade right now, or it's delayed. So you can say, I'm gonna give you this now, you give me that later, or we'll both delay this trade later. And then he says, where'd it go? Or is immediate, uh, uh, sorry, each one of these, again, is either immediate for both parties, or delayed for both parties, or immediate for one party and delayed for the other party. You can see he's a philosopher. So he looks at every single potential scenario that could happen, right? And then he says, it's my mouse. The kinds of sales that emerge are thus nine in number. So permutation, you get nine potential types of sales. Delay from both sides is not permitted by consensus or ijma. So all Muslim scholars say that if you have a delay from both sides in the transaction, it's not going to be permitted, whether it's in corporeal property, actual objects, or whether it's in liabilities, because it amounts to a proscribed, not prescribed. Does anyone know what proscribed means? No. Forbidden. Right, so it's not allowed. It's different than prescribed. It's opposite, right? So something that is forbidden exchange of a debt for a debt. So in Sharia, in Islamic law, you cannot exchange a debt for a debt. So if you have this type of delay, then it's going to be a problem. Then he says, the names of these sales are derived from the condition of the goods that are being exchanged and the form of the contract of sale itself. Thus, when two commodities are exchanged, two objects are exchanged, one may serve as a currency and the other as a priced commodity. He talks about the idea of a currency and how you can use a currency to exchange something for an actual commodity or both of them can be currencies. You're exchanging dollars for dollars or bitcoins for dollars or something like that. When, and we'll talk more about what a currency is. When a currency is exchanged for a currency, the sale is called sarf. When a currency is exchanged for a price commodity, the transaction is sale proper, meaning it's, it's, a, 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 it's a sale, bear. Similar is the sale of a price commodity for another price commodity where you're bartering goods with each other upon conditions that will be mentioned later. 
when corporeal property is exchanged for a liability, right? When you put something there and then you're going to be getting that thing later on. So you give him something, but you're going to get the thing back later on. The sale is called salam. All right, we'll talk about that a little bit later. If an option is introduced in the sale, that's not important. Next page. Then he basically, this is the most important part. So if you didn't get that, don't worry about it. This is the really important part. So he's saying that when the causes due to which legal proscription, if not being allowed, has been laid down are considered, and these are the general causes of vitiation, they are found to be four. So there's basically four things that can cause something to be haram in Islamic economics, pretty much. He's like summer, giving you the high level summary, and then the rest of his book talks about that. So he says one, the prohibition of the commodity itself. So if the thing that you're selling is haram, you're selling alcohol or something like that, it's gonna be haram. Number two, if it has usury, if it has riba, if it has riba or interest in it, that's number two. Number three, third is hazard or uncertainty, gharar. If there's a level of high level of uncertainty or hazard in there, it's gonna be forbidden in Islam. And the fourth are stipulated conditions that lead to one of the last two or both simultaneously. So anything that can lead to one of those two or both of them is also going to be considered to be uh, you know, forbidden in Islam. That's basically among the most important things. And then he talks a little bit about you know, ghish and you know, deceiving people and you know, lying and then causing injury. Uh, this is important actually because we're going to... Well, actually, this is really important for Bitcoin. So let me read this sentence. Among those in which the proscription, the, for, the, the not being allowed, is linked to an external factor are misrepresentation. Rish meaning you're, you're stealing from people, you're money laundering, you're, you're doing something along those lines. Or injury, darar, you're causing harm, whether to individuals or you're causing harm to society. Right? Or sale in a period of time assigned to a more important activity. That's an example of not being able to sell during Juma and, and sale prohibited in itself. So what he's saying is that intrinsically, four things can exist in, in an Islamic economic transaction which can cause it to be prohibited. And then there's external factors like you, know, you lied about something or this thing caused harm. That's not specific to the transaction or the object itself. It's something outside of that. All of these things are going to play a role when we look at cryptocurrency, the discussions that Muslim scholars have about cryptocurrency. So that's kind of what happens. So I'm just explaining to you the process. So Muslim scholars will go back, they'll look at books like this, and they're not just going to read the introduction, by the way. This is like the two-page introduction. They're going to go and read through all the other principles in the rest of the book, and it's a nice, big, fat book. Right? So that's, uh, that's kind of what's going to happen. Okay? Uh, the, third, the third principle actually is, is mentioned here, darar. So I mentioned there's three reasons, right? Three principles. The default is permissibility, unless you can prove it's haram. In Islamic economics, it's got to have either riba, interest, or gharar, uh, you know, uncertainty, or one of these other two things that he mentioned, which are not that relevant to us. Or number three, there's got to be darar. There's got to be some major harm that this thing causes. So for example, you know, selling weapons in a war zone to people who you know are going to be killing each other and they're totally, you know, not in control of themselves is, is something which is going to become forbidden. Not because selling weapons is forbidden in and of itself, but due to some external factor of what's going to happen when you actually are selling. Okay? So, now... That gives us a little bit of the principles that we need to know. Let's talk about the history of currency and money. So before we try to understand cryptocurrency, right, the scholar has to ask, what exactly is currency? How does it function? What do we consider to be a, a, a legitimate currency and how does it come about and all of that? So very brief history of how currency functions. Okay, So currency is basically, you know, um, People needed goods and services, that's something natural, and you want something that you can value so that you can trade that thing with a wider array of actual goods. So looking at history, in the beginning, commodity money was adopted a long time ago. So in ancient Mesopotamia, we're talking you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, they came up with a measure of currency called a shekel. And a shekel was 160 grains of barley. 
and they had a measure of that, and that became a currency which they used to use to trade in order to get goods. And of course, that has an intrinsic value, right? Because if you can't trade it, and, and you, you decide, you know what, I have all this money with me, I have this currency with me, what can I do with it? You can just cook it and eat it, right? So it's, it has an intrinsic value for you because people would use barley and that's food and it, it's, it's edible. In some other societies, they adopted different currencies. Like for example, in the Americas and in Africa, they adopted shells. So there are certain type of rare shells that they would find along, you know, in the, near the ocean and the water and all of that. And they would use those shells as a currency to be able to trade something. So if someone has, a, I don't know, a carpet or uh, whatever, like, you know, some bowls or s pots or something like that, and you don't have any other pots to trade or you don't have any other physical thing to trade, you want to have some currency that actually you give value because of the rarity of the availability of that thing, and that becomes a currency. So shells used to be used in the past as well. And then you have you know, other things which were used, other foods sometimes, but then you have gold and silver. Gold and silver became the primary currency throughout much of the world. And the reason why, should be fairly obvious, is because one, it has certain properties, there is a limited amount of it, it's, this, it's difficult to find, so this you know, limited amount, like I said, and then it's obviously shiny and cool looking and all of that stuff, right? And it plays other roles. So there's something rare about it and therefore it became a currency. So you can't just have random people just coming up with everything becomes a currency, then it has no real value. What happened after, this is called commodity money. What happened afterwards is this developed into representative money or promissory notes. So what ended up happening was people used to keep all their valuables, their gold or their, val their stuff inside of a, like a vault, like a, a, vo a bank vault or something like that. And when they put their money inside that vault, they were given a deposit slip. So when they come back, they know that they're going to be able to get this much back. So they get this slip. So what ended up happening was, eventually, they started taking this slip and say, okay, well, instead of, if I want to go buy something, instead of me going back to this vault and pulling out all of the money and then going, you know, all of my valuables and then giving it to someone else in order to get that thing from someone, I can just give them this slip. The slip transfers over to them and they can go to the vault now and get exactly what was written on my slip. And that's how you pretty much get, uh, you know, bills like, that, like we use today. So then we have currency being a bill that is backed by an asset, by an actual, you know, physical thing which has value in that society. So what happened was this gold standard was the gold standard where the bill was backed by gold became very prevalent throughout the 17th to the 19th centuries in Europe and then started spreading throughout the world in different parts as well. So what happened was these paper notes, you can convert them back into a fixed gold amount anytime you wanted to pretty much. Now in the 20th century, almost all countries adopted the gold standard. So almost everyone in the entire world is on the gold standard. They're using bills. The bill is backed by gold. In 1971, the United States ditches the gold standard and says that from now on, our bills cannot be converted back to gold. What you, they don't have, they're not going to be commodity backed anymore. So you say, well, what value do they have? They used to have some value and the value was given by commodity. They said, no, our currency is not commodity currency anymore. It is fiat currency. Fiat means, is a word which means let it be done. Meaning like it's a ummer, it's a, it's, a, it's a command. What does that mean? It means by the power of the government, we're telling you that this paper that we're printing has money, it has value. And you're simply gonna believe us, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll make you believe us if you don't believe us. And it, it, because of our power, we're able to give this paper a certain type of value. So this is kind of what happened, okay? So now, the, the money that you have in your pocket, the bills that you have, if, especially if you're in America or most of the world as well, you're on fiat currency, right? So this actual paper, the value that it has is generated by the fact that the government is telling you that it has a certain type of value. It doesn't have any commodity value. I mean, you can, you can blow your nose with it or you can make a paper airplane with it, but that's not very good value, okay? So that's where we are right now in terms of fiat currency. Now what happened was somewhere along the lines, banks that were having money deposits into their vaults, they realized that, you know what, most people who put their money inside the vault with us, 
they don't really withdraw all of their valuables. They just kind of leave it in there with us. So what we can do is we can make money by loaning out the valuables that they leave inside of our vault while they're gone because they're not likely to come and get it. So we can loan it out and we can collect interest, which is money on the valuables that we're giving out. And we can collect that interest and make a lot more money than just paying like guarding fees for our vault. And what we'll do on top of that is we'll go ahead and give a little bit of the interest that we make to the person who's depositing money so they deposit more money and they're more likely to keep it in there for a long period of time. So they can make a lot more money. So the first uh, central bank that was doing something like this started in 1668. That was the Swedish Riksbank. And what they did was they set a reserve requirement. In order to prevent a bank run from happening, you have to have a certain amount where you say, we have to keep this much money inside our vault that we don't loan out to other people because if all these people come and say, I want my money right now, and then you don't have all of it because you loaned it out, you can have what's called a bank run and now you're gonna have a problem, you're gonna default. So that's where, that's kind of the next development in banking. The latest development, the development after that became what's called fractional reserve banking. This is extremely important to understand in order to answer the question on cryptocurrency and its value. So fractional reserve banking, we have to understand the difference in currency and money. They're not the same thing. Maybe they were the same thing in the past, but they're not. So what happens is fractional reserve banking basically works like this. I'm oversimplifying it, but this is from books of economics. You have $10,000. You put $10,000 into the bank, okay? How much money do you own? It's, you still own, technically you own $10,000, right? So the bank, being a bank, will take that money that they have in there and they will loan $9,000 of the money that you put in the bank to someone else, okay? You still have $10,000. The company, the, the person that the bank loaned the money to, they have how much money now? $9,000, right? So now the company, they will use the $9,000 to pay nine of its workers or something like that. Each of them gets $1,000. All of them take $1,000 home with them. You still have $10,000. Each of the workers has $1,000. Each worker goes and puts the $1,000 back into a bank and then the loop starts over again. So what's happening is more money is being created than actually exists in its current form, in the form of currency. That is a fractional reserve banking system, which means basically that if you have a, whatever, 10% reserve limit or something, you put $10,000 in the bank, the bank can take 9,000 of your $10,000 and loan it out to someone else. And that money become, that, that adds to the money supply of the actual country. So this is the way money supply works. Now this is, some of you are like, you know, what is, how does money just magically appear on a number? Well, where does this money come from? Well, it's something that's recorded on a register. This is how money functions in our economy today, okay? So the money supply of any country, let's take United States, is the amount of currency that exists added to bank money, which is, what is bank money? Bank money are just numbers in a ledger, in a transaction record, and you add those together and that becomes the money supply of a country. So let me give you an example of what that looks like in America. In December of 2010, in the United States, there was $8.8 .8 trillion in the broad money supply. It's what's called M2. 915 billion, which is about 10% of that, consisted of actual physical coins and paper money. So the other 90% is not in physical existence. This is gonna be a very important point because one of the, you know, one of the uh, arguments that people make against Bitcoin or against cryptocurrency is that it doesn't exist in reality. It has no, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, it has no tangible reality. And you can't take it out for, you know, something physical. So therefore it has no existence. We understand how fractional reserve banking works. We understand how the money supply of a country actually works. We see that we have to give an answer in light of the current economic system that we live in and we function with and we deal with and we don't really complain so much about it.
Okay, so this is something that I wanted to explain about the history of currency and money. How many of you knew all of that, by the way? Okay, so we have about 10%, not even 5% people who knew that. That's good. So this is important to know. This is the way it functions, okay? So now let's move on to the history of cryptocurrency, what it is and how it functions. Okay, so um, there was... So let me go back to a little bit history. You know, the idea of digital cash or having a, the idea of having a digital currency is not new. It's actually a very old concept. There was a guy, you know, there was many, many people in, you know, different computer science departments. One of them was in Berkeley. He wrote a paper on it in 1980s. This guy came. I'll just give you, there's a bunch of companies that were launched. One example of one company of digital currency was called DigiCash. DigiCash was launched in 1989. This is a long time ago, right? This is way before all of this. So what he did was, he says, we're going to use cryptography to prevent either the bank or the government from tracing online payments. So the internet was around. People were using the internet in 1989. Not too many people, but people were using it. And he says, but these transactions that we're doing online, they're traceable. So we want to use cryptography, which is a way of, you know, it's mathematical algorithms to kind of disguise things. So kind of like a secret message, you can say. We want to use that technology to do what specifically? We don't want banks and we don't want governments being able to trace the online payments that we have. So they invented a company. They launched a company called DigiCash in 1989. This became actually accepted. It was accepted by Deutsche Bank in Germany and another bank. Which, which, which is a really big thing, right? Like Deutsche Bank is a really major bank uh, in the world. So this was accepted, it was acknowledged, it was approved, but it shut down, the company shut down in 1998. What was the main reason why it shut down? People were not ready for this technology. They're like, you know, people, it took the internet a long time for people to kind of, you know, get used to it. People, you know, they're not comfortable with it. I remember people used to always say, I'll, I'll never trust online banking. And now everyone does online banking, right? They're like, I don't trust putting my money in there. It just takes time for things to develop. This was not the right time. The 80s and the 90s were not that time. So what happened was, is that this was not a major issue because it was not a decentralized currency. It was a digital currency in a way, but people just weren't ready for it, but it didn't become a big issue. Now what we have is the idea of having a digital currency is there in existence. You know, PayPal has been there for a long time. Venmo, those of you who use Venmo to send money to people, things like that. There's a lot of different, you know, you can call, you can say kind of digital currencies or digital cash or something like that. So when it comes to this cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, there's nothing new about digital currency. The only thing that's new and innovative and something that no one has ever really seen is the idea that is decentralized right and I'm gonna explain to you what that means right what decentralized means is that in the past before anytime you want to send money to someone else right how does that money transfer over you have to have a third party so if I want to send money to Ali right uh, digitally what's gonna happen is that I will, you know, do some kind of transfer from an app or something like that, which money had for me, and I transfer it over to Ali, and I have to have a third party to verify that my money has transferred over again to the other person. Now, the issue is this, right? We have to have someone in the middle because if you look at digital files, files don't transfer per se. They copy. Like if you have, you're working on a document, and your friend says, hey, send me that document. You email them the doc. I'm trying to make it easy for you, right? You email them the document over. You can keep a copy of that document, right? So it doesn't just transfer over to the person and now you don't have it anymore. Now what's going to happen is if you have a digital currency, how do you ensure that when you send it over to someone else, it's not in your possession anymore and you didn't keep a copy? And what's going to happen is this is called the double spending problem. That I can go and after I send it to you, I still have my copy, I can go and spend it with someone else. So until 2008, as far as I know, no one was really able to figure out or solve what's called the double spending problem. How do you resolve this issue 
without having a third party. So what does the third party do? You know, you take MasterCard or you take the government or a bank or whatever it is. They're going to verify. I sent you the, the file, like PayPal, for example. I send Ali a certain amount of money. PayPal is the third party who's watching and saying, hey, you transferred this money over there. What we're going to do is you have a ledger, a, a record, right? We're going to subtract this number from your record and we're going to add this number to the other person's record to ensure that you don't keep a copy and you're not going to try and double spend that. So you have to have this third par party, you know, mediating between you. So that was kind of the issue. All right. Now what happened was something really big happened in 2008 in the world. It was a major world event, right? Outside of me graduating from Islamic school and coming back and becoming an imam, there was another major world event. I'm just kidding. There's another major world event that happened. Does anyone know what that event was? Financial meltdown, financial crisis, right? And why the financial crisis happened, I mean, that's a whole nother, you know, another hour lecture. But why the financial crisis happened, a lot of it had to do with deregulation from the government and it led to uh, and, and, and banks misuse and all of that, it led to distrust around the world, even in America, about the role of the government in banking and economics and the role of banks specifically. And, and this is like the biggest, you know, one of the biggest, you know, crimes, probably the history of the world in terms of how much money, you know, was lost and everything. And how many people went to jail for it? Uh, none, almost none. Like one little small guy, that's it. Every, everyone else, they all just got bonuses and raises and they got bailed out and the bailout plan and all of that stuff happened. You, sh you, this is, you, know, you, should, you should look into that. This is a very important world event. So what happened in 2008 and what was leading up to that, people were really upset. And now you have a group of online hackers, right, who are really good with computers. They start looking back into this idea which was popular since the 90s and the 80s of digital cash and digital currency and all that. And they say, we need to figure out a way to cut out the government and cut out the banks from being that third party because we, one, we cannot necessarily trust them. So it started, the idea started gaining momentum because look how they man manipulated things and it led to a financial meltdown and people were losing their houses and their jobs and almost everything. So they're saying the, uh, there was a loss of trust that happened that was one. Uh, and then two, you know, there's just obviously all these trans having a third party causes transaction fees. So what happened was there's a guy by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. He's not a real person. This is his fake name. He may be a group of people, right? Nobody knows really. He kind of disappeared when someone, his partner said, I want to go and present this idea to the CIA. He just disappeared. <laughs> No one ever heard of him again. He's very paranoid, obviously. Uh, so he publishes a paper in 2008. And this is a very important paper. Now, a lot of people are investing in Bitcoin and all that. They don't understand how it really functions. They don't understand what the philosophy behind it was, the motive behind it. It's important for a scholar, a Muslim scholar, to understand the motive behind things because then they can understand the philosophy behind it and then they can see how that philosophy lines up with the philosophy of Islamic law. So this is all very, very important for a scholar. I'm not just doing this because I'm you know, interested in a history lesson or something. So Satoshi Nakamoto publishes this small paper. It's like 10 pages. It's not, a, you know, a w it's not difficult to read. If you have a little knowledge of computers or a good knowledge of computers, little, <laughs> it's, it's not that difficult to understand. But it's absolute ingenious paper. So I'm going to go over the introduction with you so you have a good understanding. You understand where this is coming from. This is his abstract. This is his overview of the idea. I'm going to give you tafsir of this too. Don't worry, okay? I'll give you a little explanation, inshallah. So he's saying, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. So he's saying, if we can figure out a system where I can send you money directly without having to go through the third-party financial system, whether it's PayPal or Visa or MasterCard or a bank, if, we can, if I can figure out how to do that, this is what we're going to do in this paper. We're going to outline a model for that. So he's saying digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. So I told you about the double spending problem. So he's saying you can have all these digital signatures and everything, but you have to have this third party. 
how do you cut out the third party and how do you solve the double spending problem? So he says, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? So basically what's going to happen, this is going to be a distributed system of computers all around um, and different people are going to be running this software. I'm trying to simplify, simplify it for you. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So basically he's talking about what some of you have heard. Who has heard of the word blockchain technology? All right, so quite a few have heard of it. He's basically coming up with the idea of the blockchain here in 2008. So he's saying, look, we're going to figure out a way <coughs> to put, uh, put all these transactions together in a long chain and there's no way you can somehow mess this chain up. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying the longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. So what he's saying is that, you know what, look, people are going to try and hack this, right? They're going to try and break in and mess up the whole computer system and everything. So I'm going to give you all these safeguards to protect it and prevent it from being hacked. So this is his idea. So his idea is, as long as the majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. Right, now this is very, this is very important statement here. This is, philosophically it's very important. What he's saying is that we're going to develop a system that as long as the majority of CPU power of all these different computers that different users are using this software on throughout the entire world, as long as they all are not cooperating to try to hack the entire system together, it will not be, it cannot be hacked. Why is this so important? It's important because of the idea of having decentralized currency means that you're not trusting the government and you're not trusting the banks. If you're not trusting the government and you're not trusting the banks, they are kind of like the elite people, they're a small group of people. So what are you doing? You have to trust somebody. Someone somewhere along the line has to be trusted, otherwise you cannot have currency. So he's redistributing the trust that's required for any currency, especially a fiat type of currency, for it to actually have some value. So the trust is redistributed from the elite government slash banks, distributed across anyone who wants to participate in the system. And the assumption is kind of democratic, right? The assumption is as long as you have all of these distributed computer computers working at the same time, as long as they all don't team up together or the majority of them don't team up together to try to overthrow this chain, then it's, you cannot hack the system. You have trust in the people who are just running this that they're not going to all collaborate together. And basically this is a revolutionary idea saying that we have more trust in a distributed network of of people who are interested in this idea, then we, we have more trust in that than we do in specific people who may be elected to government or who may be in charge of banks. And that's where this idea becomes very revolutionary. And then he says messages are broadcast on a best effort. Nodes can leave and join, rejoin the network at will. So anyone can join basically. Anyone can become part of this and uh, you accept the longest proof of chain as work of what happened. So that's, that's the, basically the philosophy of what Satoshi is coming up with. Okay, so that's the idea that he came up with. Okay, so a few things to note here. There is no Bitcoin company. I hear this from, I'm trying to dispel some myths here. There is no Bitcoin company, it doesn't exist. It's a technology. There is no building, right? There's no Bitcoin building where if you have Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, what if that building gets bombed, you lose all your money? There's no building specifically. It's distributed across the world and people can be added to it. There is no server. There's no computer system that you can like shut down because it's a distributed network across the world. Um, so that's a few aspects of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, he made this blockchain ledger. It's a distributed ledger that goes across. A ledger is something which you record transactions in. So normally the ledger of any other normal currency that's you know centralized currency that's run by government is going to be controlled either by the you know Federal Reserve Bank or the Central Bank or something like that. They have all these records and obviously they have backup copies and everything. They keep track of this. This is an automated system 
that is automatically going to be keeping track of this and he figured out a way to do this and a little bit complicated to explain. Encryption technology is going to be used to regulate the currency. So two things are going to happen in, with encryption. Crypto is coming from encryption. What is encryption going to do? What is technology going to help here? Number one, it's going to regulate the generation of currency. So normally the generation of currency or the generation of money is regulated by the government. And like we said, you know, the, the government generally has no limits on how much money they can create. We talked about creating money and fiat currency and fractional reserve banking. The more currency that's created, the more money that's created, what happens to the value of your money? It, de it de devalues, right? It's inflation. So, so he's saying we're going to use an encryption, encryption uh, let me explain how, what is encryption. We're going to use computer technology to figure out, we're going to regulate and have a very clear way to generate currency. And also we're going to use encryption to verify the transfer of funds to make sure that the, this person cannot double spend when you transfer money, but there's no central, there's no third party that's needed in this entire process. So that's kind of an overview of kind of how it works to give you a little bit summary. There's three ways to attain cryptocurrency. Number one, you either take fiat currency that you have, you take dollars, for example, you go to a Bitcoin exchange and you buy Bitcoin and they take your money and then you get it in your Bitcoin wallet. Number two, you can transfer from another user who has Bitcoin, you can give them cash or whatever it is, uh, or, or you can transfer Bitcoin to Bitcoin. And then number three is mining, okay? Uh, I'm thinking whether I should explain mining because this is getting long. Um, I'm not going to go into details about how mining works, but basically there's a maximum number of Bitcoins and that's 21 million. Once it reaches that number, there cannot be more. So what ends up happening is you cannot cr keep on creating more and more of these things. Therefore, there's been arguments that, and there's a 2040, you know, 2000 year 2040 limit. Th there's an argument that this could potentially be a much more stable currency than a fiat currency because you cannot just keep on you know, adding more and more to it whenever you want to. All right, so without going into more details, uh, what happened historically, okay? Historically, um, Bitcoin comes out as the first cryptocurrency. So it's the first one that's established. Satoshi, right after the few weeks after the fall of Lehman Brothers, major bank, investment bank, he says, we need to program this thing quickly. He comes up with the idea, he makes it functional, and he, he launches Bitcoin. So what happens is in the beginning, there were two types of people who cared about Bitcoin. They were either computer enthusiasts, they just liked the idea of, you know, it's cool technology and we're going to make something new. And then there were libertarians. These are people who don't trust the currency that we have right now and they're more about having a stable currency, it should be gold back, people like Ron Paul and, you know, Rand Paul and all of that. So <clears throat> there were two people who were primarily interested in, in that. Um, but Bitcoin was primarily supposed to not be exchanged back into currency and then changed back because that's going to actually take you back into the system. So the libertarians and other people who don't trust the currency that we use today, they had a different idea or understanding. Okay? Now this, some of this history is important to understand the fatwas that are coming out from different councils. So what happens? 2011 uh, or a little bit earlier before that, I forgot the year, there's a website called Silk Road, which is launched. How many of you heard of eBay? Okay, you heard of eBay, right? Like Craigslist, eBay, you can sell stuff online. So Silk Road is like eBay, but it's anonymous and it accepts Bitcoin only. So the transactions are anonymous. So you can sell almost anything you want on, on eBay, except things like drugs, things like weapons, things like things you shouldn't be selling basically, which are not allowed. Silk Road opens up, it's anonymous, it uses the Tor browser, it has a dot .onion URL, I won't get into that, and primarily it's being used to sell drugs because you can sell all your other stuff on, on, on eBay. Now obviously the transaction costs are a lot lower, you don't have to pay you know, eBay the same amount of money that you're paying or Craigslist or whatever, Craigslist not, it doesn't cost money, but so what happens is Silk Road proves to the world that people are willing to adopt this technology, not for very good reasons, you know, because they're buying drugs, but they prove that the technology works. They prove that 
people are able to do it, you know, it's functional, it's working, people are using this as a currency, and they're using, you know, they're, they're doing all sorts of weird stuff. They're buying drugs, there's a guy who's a hitman, and he's like, I can kill someone for you, you know, pay me in Bitcoin, and it's not traceable, and you know, I can take care of that, and you can go on this website and you can do that. So obviously, Silk Road was shut down. Now what happened was, in the beginning, if any of the scholars, they knew about Bitcoin in the beginning, when they found out that Bitcoin was being used for Silk Road to sell drugs primarily, what do you think their fatwa is going to be? Huh. What, is this? What, what kind of technology is this? So just so these people can sell their drugs, you're obviously going to get a haram fatwa, right? And there's very few of those fatwas early, that early. But what's really interesting is, when Silk Road was shut down, the FBI confiscated $13.5 million worth of Bitcoin at that time. When they confiscate it, what is the FBI supposed to do with it? Well, they, they don't want, just want to like throw it away. The FBI, you know, they need, they need their money too, right? So what do they do? They auction it and they sell it. What does that do, right? What that does is it shows that an American governmental institution legitimized the value of a digital decentralized currency. And that's a, maybe, the, you know, they probably didn't think about <laughs> what the ramifications of that were, but they're showing that there's some legitimacy to this, right? So that was a really big thing. Later on, 2014, government said that if you own Bitcoin, you have to pay taxes on it because they were concerned. People have Bitcoin and they have money. They're like, we're losing on taxes. People are cutting out taxes. So they said, you know, they issued the American government fatwa, right? They said, you got to pay taxes. So what does that do? Again, the government is not supposed to like this idea. The government, is, whoever works for the government, generally they don't like the idea of decentralized currency because it reduces their power, right? But what happens is, they're like, but we're losing taxes. So we at least say, hey, you gotta pay taxes. What does that do? It partially shows more legitimacy to the fact that this is becoming a currency and it's something that actually has value. In 2015, US government launches something called Bit License, where they're trying to regulate the use of Bitcoin, um, and then there was some scandal about all of that stuff, we won't go into it. And then what happens is basically now we're in 2017, the price skyrockets on Bitcoin, and now we have people who took the code that was used for Bitcoin and they made alternative cryptocurrencies. So if you go to coinmarketcap.com, there's about 1500 cryptocurrencies there today. And so many of them are just being made you know, on a daily basis. What that basically means is, if you shut down Bitcoin, right? if someone says we're gonna absolutely shut it down and we're gonna stop it from happening, and you know, some people have argued that potentially the NSA has the computing power, maybe, to actually attack, you know, as Satoshi said you can't attack it and everything. They have so much computing power, they could potentially attack it and maybe shut it down. But the thing is, they can shut down one cryptocurrency or they can shut down Bitcoin or something like that. Within the end of the day, Bitcoin 2.0 will come out. And they shut that down, Bitcoin 3.0 will come out because this is an idea and you can't shut down an idea that people are interested in. So I'm saying this because people still have this idea that, oh, this may just go away, it may just a fad, it'll just disappear. As long as people are interested in it, they're gonna keep it alive kind of no matter what happens, okay? so. That is a little bit about the histories. Let's go to the pros. So the pros of cryptocurrency, like Bitcoin and all the other ones, the pros are number one, and why are these pros important? I'm gonna to go to the pros and the cons. Because many of the fatwas, the religious rulings, that are saying it's allowed or it's not allowed, they're built on these things. And one of the things that we saw, what Ibn Rushd Averroes was saying, is that if there's gonna be harm right, dollar or harm that is caused by this cryptocurrency, then it should be forbidden in Islam. But you have to weigh between the pros and the cons, between the harms and the benefits that exist when you want to actually understand this currency. So let's take a look at some of the pros. First, then we'll go cons. So some of the pros, reduce transaction fee, right? The mid, there's no middleman. So when you're sending, there's no bank involved, right? So when you send money to someone else, you don't have to pay these large transaction fees. So look at, for example, Western Union, MoneyGram, you're sending you know, money to your family back home. Bitcoin can, or a cryptocurrency can replace that because you don't have that third party asking you to pay all these transaction fees. 
Let's take a look at some statistics here. $400 billion yearly is transferred from immigrants back to their families in like the poor countries where they had come from. And when they transfer it, especially if they're in a rural area, there's a 9% service charge. Now for some of you are like, ah, I could do 9%, but those people can't. Like every percent or half a percent or fraction of a percent is a very big thing for them because they're poor. They don't have the same type of money that we have. So what's going to happen is that the pro of cryptocurrency allows money transfer to be sent without a third party. Therefore, you can cut the transaction fees almost entirely or very significantly. Okay. Um, one of the reasons now to defend the third party a little bit, we don't want to just keep throwing them under the bus. The reason why they charge transaction fees is because um, they have a certain type of insurance. If you spend, you can't spun, spend money that you don't have. You know, if, if something happens, there's a problem, money is stolen from your account or something, they'll give you some kind of, you know, they're like, oh, we'll take care of it or we'll reverse a transaction or something like that. But the good thing about cryptocurrency is you don't need to convert it. If the people want to convert it back into their local currency, they can. If they don't want to convert it back and they want to just go and transact between themselves, they can do it. And this is what happened early on, I mean, a few years back in Bitcoin is that people who started using it, they were people from poor countries who did not trust their own governments because their own government sometimes starts printing so much money, it devalues the currency. So they're willing to trust anything else besides their own government. And you have to understand that. So part of this comes back down to which government do you live in and how much do you trust your government compared to how much do you trust the volatility of a, of, of a technology or a currency like cryptocurrency. All right. Um, few, a few other things. Most um, people who live in very poor areas, right, they don't have traditional bank branch facilities because they're living in farm areas, rural areas. There's no banks that are being built. So it's very hard or very costly for someone to set up these type of branch institutions. They can't do that. But with cryptocurrency, they can be doing that on a digital scale. Also, uh, the idea of, um, what was I, I going to say? I lost my other point. But anyways, people who are poor areas, they can benefit from this a lot. The, the second uh, pro is that crypt, uh, cryptocurrency is actually much more difficult to hack than other uh, companies that have like one server. So the thing is, this is a common question people have like, you know, what if it's hacked and you lose your money? I mean, JP Morgan has been hacked, Home Depot has been hacked, Target has been hacked and they stole all the credit cards and all of that stuff. When you have one server in one place or in a few places, it's easy, it can be hacked. Right? When it's distributed, it's a lot more difficult to hack it. So technically, you know, you can't shut it down just by attacking one or a few targets. So it's actually more secure. You can make the argument that it's more secure than centralized, uh, you know, companies or something like that. Okay. The third pro is that you can prevent government manipulation. Okay. So if those of you who followed news not too long ago, a few years back, look at Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's government overprinted money and their money became worthless, completely worthless. So all the people who had their money basically became poor overnight. Their, their, their Zimbabwe dollar went into like 100 trillion for like, you know, 100 trillion per bill or something like that. So they overprinted money, you get hyperinflation, people lose all of their wealth. So what happens is that people in Zimbabwe, they love cryptocurrency. They're very happy because they don't, they don't trust the government to somehow not be prevented from doing something like this again. And they already saw what happened to them or maybe to their parents, you know, just like a, a decade ago or something like that. So the question comes back down to who do you trust more? Because a lot of fatwas that are coming up by Muslim scholars, they're saying that we cannot say that a decentralized currency is halal because of the risk that exists. But this comes back down to, do you trust your government more, depending on where you live, or do you trust a P2P distributed network around the world more? That, that's not an easy question to answer, but that plays a role in giving a final verdict on what cryptocurrency is going to be or what Bitcoin is going to be. Okay? So many countries have these problematic histories, 
right? So for them, they don't care if the price is volatile. At least there's some store of value for, for, for a cryptocurrency. The next thing is, uh, oh yeah, that's the other point I was going to make on the poverty. Many people cannot open a bank account. There are many people in the world, they cannot open a bank account. So how can they do any type of digital transactions or something like that? This gives them an opportunity to be able to participate in you know, quick transactions without having to open a bank account. Let's say you have a dry cleaning business, for example, and you want to start accepting uh, payments from people, digital payments. What will you have to do normally? You have to apply for a visa account, you have to get the machine, you, know, you have to pay the transaction fees. Or you could just say, hey, we accept cryptocurrency, <laughs> you know, and then you just have a cryptocurrency reader there. You can just grab it from your phone and they can pay you immediately. Very minimal transaction fees. So this becomes very easy for people to process transactions, okay? And the last pro, again, comes back down to trust. So this happens in history again. In 2010, there was a website, and there's still a website, called WikiLeaks. Anyone heard of WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks basically leaks information about government scandals and corruption and all that. Whether you fully agree with them or not, you know, that's, that's a whole other issue. What ended up happening was in 2010, the government, because they weren't happy with some of the information that was being leaked out about them, they suspended donations to WikiLeaks through PayPal. So, they, so PayPal was given pressure by the government says, you're not allowed to process WikiLeaks donations anymore. And that's how they relied on all of their money. I mean, there's a donation-based organization. So now, WikiLeaks was thinking, okay, well, what are we going to do? We're going to shut down. The government has forced PayPal to stop dealing with us because we're exposing some government things. So what did they do? They said, don't worry. We're going to accept Bitcoin. And this was 2010. This is very early on, right? It's very new. So they said, we will accept Bitcoin. And they started getting donations in the form of Bitcoin. And even people who did not use Bitcoin, they can convert their dollars into Bitcoin or whatever currency and then donate back to WikiLeaks. So they can continue doing the work that they're doing, especially if you agree with that work. So what that does is that's potentially a pro, assuming that you support WikiLeaks, which I, for the most part, do. Um, so what that does is allows people who are doing good work to kind of go beyond and not be regulated by government who may have an agenda to, you know, to protect themselves or cover up scandals or cover up things that probably shouldn't be covered up in the first place. So, so that, that was a very important thing. So these are some of the pros of cryptocurrency, okay? Let's go to the cons of cryptocurrency. All right, so some of the cons, and we're almost done, we're not that far, okay? Uh, we talked about Silk Road, opened in 2011. They started you know, selling all this bad stuff. So it's a problem. You can do bad things with cryptocurrency. There was a guy, you've heard, anyone heard of 3D printers? You know, 3D printing, right? So one guy came up with an idea. He said, I'm gonna make, uh, he went on Indiegogo, which is like a fun, crowdfunding place. And he said, I made a schematic, I'm making a schematic for a gun. I sell you the schematic, you put it into your 3D printer, and you can print your own gun. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but it's kind of dangerous because anyone can print their own gun, and it's actually going to be a functional gun. So Indiegogo shut him down. He said, you're not allowed to do this. You know, this is not acceptable. So if he wanted to go and say, okay, well, I have Silk Road, or I have, I'll accept Bitcoin. I don't need to accept your money. I can go ahead and continue to sell it. You say, well, there's a con there. This allows bad people to do bad things and it makes it easier for them. So that's an, one argument that people are saying when it comes to why cryptocurrency should be forbidden in Islam from an Islamic perspective. Of course, he could still go and sell it you know, to his friends for cash you know, if he wanted to. But this just makes it easier. So it makes it easier for good people to do good and it makes it easier for bad people to do bad. And that's where you need to kind of you know, draw a line somewhere, right? So well, at what point does it become so bad that we need to say, hey, this is something that should be stopped? Like, I mean, criminals use email too, right? To like, do their meetups and stuff like that. Are we gonna shut down email? Are we gonna regulate things like that? So that's the question. Governments were shutting down social media during protests and all of that. So that's something. 
Another con is that the, um, uh, what are they called? SubhanAllah, I'm drawing a blank right now. The place where you exchange Bitcoin. Huh? There's another name for ex what exchange? What is it called? Huh? No, no, not blockchain. Anyways, okay. Uh, the, the exchanges, okay? The exchanges that exist when people want to exchange, one of them was, a big one was called Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox basically is one example of a big thing that happened where we had half a billion dollars of missing bitcoins from this company where people were storing their bitcoins, right? So that's 6% of the total circulation of bitcoins and they're either stolen or they're lost or they somehow disappeared. Now this is not a problem in the Bitcoin network, this is a problem in that specific exchange, right? And then they caught the guy and they were trying to figure out and the guy was moved to Japan and he was arrested in Japan and all of that. So the issue comes back down to these currency exchanges or, or cryptocurrency exchanges, they are a form of a third party introduced into a decentralized system that's not supposed to have a third party for convenience. So you have to be able to trust your third party. So you're going to have some people who are third parties, which are Bitcoin exchanges or, or cryptocurrency exchanges. And if they're not regulated well, they can be ripping off a lot of people. And that's kind of what happened with Mt. Gox probably. And that's what happened with a few other cases. So the argument is made is that when you have the government regulating banks, at least you have more protection because there's a set of regulations there. Whereas when someone's doing this and they're not being regulated, there's a lot more danger for people to get scammed and lose all of their money. So that's another argument that feeds into it. And the last argument, the last con uh, really is that Bitcoin is very volatile, right? It has a market cap trading, you know, very high. A uh, lot of Bitcoin is basically held for speculation purposes. So you see the price is fluctuating. Like I said before, a lot of people lost a lot of money, a lot of people made a lot of money, or maybe some people made a lot of money, most people probably got too greedy and kept spending and lost a lot of money. So, it comes back down to the purpose of money. What is the purpose of money? Money has three purposes according to economists. Number one, it's a measure of value. In that sense, to summarize, Bitcoin, like other type of currency, is a measure of value. It has a fixed value even though it fluctuates and it helps measure things for people. Number two, it's a medium of exchange. Cryptocurrency is an excellent medium of exchange because there's no third party and transaction costs, it's quick transactions and the costs are very, very low uh, because of that technology. And then the third, uh, you know, the third purpose of money is that it's a store of value. Something where you're going to keep it for a long time and you hope that it continues to maintain its value. The problem with cryptocurrency right now is that it's extremely vol uh, volatile. So it's not a very good store of value currently, right now. But it's been argued in many papers and all of that, Journal of Islamic Economics had a paper on this, um, that because inflation exists in the other fiat currencies and that's just the way the banking system you know, functions. Because there's a cap on the amount of Bitcoins that can be produced and other cryptocurrencies may have their own you know, versions of things, that it could potentially serve in the future as a better store of value than the current currency that we actually have if it stabilizes, okay? So the last thing is we have a few questions about Islamic legality. So we talked about the principles, we talked about the philosophy behind currency and money and what it means. And then we talk about the philosophy of Islamic principles which could potentially make it haram. These three things have to all be understood before we come to a conclusion on something. So, a few questions that people have uh, that comes out and make arguments, right? Number one, uh, the question that we have to ask is how is cryptocurrency different enough from fiat currency that makes one halal and the other haram. I mean most, almost everyone says that fiat currency is halal. Whether you think it's intrinsically halal or halal because by necessity we use it, right? No scholar is going to come and say, you know the hundred dollar bill that I have in my pocket, that's actually haram, you know, because they have to, you know, use currency as well. It's not going to function in life. So the question is now, it's not about what is ideally Islamic. How 
is cryptocurrency different from a fiat currency such that one could potentially be halal with the fiat and the other one could be haram? That's a question that uh, I think people are not giving a very clear answer to when they say that it's haram. And I'll come back to that. Number two, the objection comes is that it's just digital. It has no real value. It has no physical existence. As I mentioned to you before, money in today's economic system, uh, fiat currency, has no real value either. I'm sorry to say it. There's no actual value, commodity type value for that thing. And then when it comes to the idea it has no physical existence, right? The money inside the banking system with the fractional reserve system, the 90% or whatever, it has, uh, it has no physical existence either. It's a number in a ledger, which is exactly what cryptocurrency is. It's a number in a ledger and that ledger is distributed. And the difference is the ledger of a central government is kept in, you know, is, is controlled by a central system. Okay. So the next question that gets asked is how do you classify cryptocurrency? Is it a digital asset? Is it a commodity currency? Is it a representative currency? Or is it a uh, fiat currency? So the answer, all right, well, let's work through it real quick. Is it a commodity currency? No, because it's not tied to any commodity. Is it a representative currency? No. Is it a fiat currency? Because there's no government, right? No fiat. Is it a digital asset? Is it an asset? Uh, this is where it matters, right? So the answer is, is it a digital asset or is it a digital currency? Why does this matter? This plays a very big role in giving the Islamic answer. Because if it's an asset, you're allowed to have what's called riba on it. Riba meaning you can charge a profit because an asset you can charge a profit on top of it. If it's a digital currency, you cannot have currency switched with another currency for more value because that's the very definition of interest. So defining it as being a currency versus an asset is extremely important. And you find a lot of different papers coming out on this from different you know, Muslim scholars and different think tanks saying one that it's an asset, therefore we're actually allowed to charge you know, a type of interest or additional profit on it. The other one's saying no, you cannot do that because it functions like a currency. It was designed like a currency. Its original purpose was to be a currency. So how did you all of a sudden give it to be the idea of a digital asset? So I think that it's a very weak argument personally to, to, to classify it as a digital asset. So the idea, do the rules of riba actually apply uh, to it because it's digital currency, the answer is, the, meaning the prohibition of riba, does it apply to it? Can you trade one Bitcoin for two Bitcoins, you know, on deferred payment or something like that? The answer is, yes, the rules of riba apply to it, meaning you're not supposed to be doing any type of interest on it. All right, the next question is, a lot of fatwas have come out saying that if you do not have government control of a currency, the fatwa should be that it's haram because of the amount of harm that can come. This is the most common thread that I've seen. I've gone through about, you know, 10 different papers and like, you know, 10, 10 more different articles on it by different, you know, Muslim scholars. This is one of the very common arguments that you find throughout most of the papers. Is that do you need to have government controlling currency in order to say that it's safe enough to not cause a great amount of harm in society? I think this is very debatable and this is something that really we need to be working this out because what's going on here is that we have a lot of things that government ne don't necessarily have control over even in America like for example anyone use Tor browser Tor so Tor is a browser it's called the onion relay T-O-R it's an anonymous browser it was developed by the government developed by the government and when you use it you cannot be traced back. You can make an anonymous website, you can you know, s you know, surf anonymously, and it's very, very difficult, even for NSA or someone, to actually be able to trace where you're going, especially FBI and all of that stuff, right? Um, but it's allowed, it's not banned, right? And in many places it's there. There are, you know, so, so we need to be very, very careful. And I say we, I mean like, you know, Muslims in, in general, in our attitude and our outlook, before we say, before we become pro-government versus anti-government, 
we need to really weigh the pros and cons. And I know that people come from different backgrounds. We're in Southern California. I think a lot of young people, they're very anti-government. They're like, you know, anarchy, we're going to take over, and you know, we can't trust these governments. And the other people are very pro-government. They so, you know you have to have government to regulate things and keep things in control and order. Both of these things are true. We have to have a, re a balance between them. But when you're out of balance, then there's a problem, right? So that's where, in my opinion, Muslim scholars need to be very, very careful of taking a side on this political issue, which really varies with time and place. It varies from country to country. It varies with political circumstances when you're assessing harm versus benefit, okay? The next uh, argument is that there's no spending protection. So when you spend uh, Bitcoin, or let's say someone comes and robs you, and they put a gun to your head, which happened recently to one guy, uh, uh, actually happened in Turkey uh, recently, Th took $3 million, $3 million worth of Bitcoin from him, forced him to log into his password and, and do it. Now if they did that somewhere else, at least you have a centralized you know, bank or a, a third party can come in and kind of reverse the transaction or trace the transaction. Here it's very anonymous. So that uh, is a potential objection that people, you cannot reverse the transaction, you, sh you pretty much can't trace the transaction exactly. But then the flip side to that is, what is the flip side, what is the answer to that objection? Anyone? That's like cash. <laughs> You can't do, I mean, if you give, if someone comes and you have a lot of cash on you, they're going to steal it from you too and you can't reverse the transaction. And you can't trace the transaction because there's no, you know, uh, tracing mechanism on that cash, right? So it makes it easier, like I said, it makes it easier to do good and it makes it easier to do bad. And we need to be careful where we're supposed to draw the line there, okay? The next thing is, that what if someone shuts it down, you lose all your money? I've already addressed this issue. What amount of regulation? So this is my question to people who say that it's forbidden, it's haram, because there's no regulation on it. The question is, what amount of regulation would make it halal? And there's no clear-cut answer here, but this is a question that I'm throwing out. What amount of regulation is needed? To what extent has, to, has it to be regulated in order for it to become halal, whereas on the other side it crosses you know, the haram thing? And then, of course, is it's anonymous, so if it's anonymous, then you know, how, you know, it's a, it's a problem. Cash is anonymous too. In fact, cash is technically more anonymous than cryptocurrency because at least there's a ledger of cryptocurrency. Even if you can't trace it back, it exists. The transactions logs exist, whereas cash doesn't exist, okay? So conclusions, and then I'll take questions. So there have been several claims of cryptocurrency being haram, and there's a few claims of cryptocurrency being halal, right, which was the default position. So among the people who declared it haram, I've come across several um, clear-cut answers. Grand Mufti of Egypt declared it haram in January 2018. The Director of Religious Affairs, Diyanat in Turkey in 2017, declared it banned, basically, and, and haram. And uh, there's other scholars, one research paper came out of Medina University declaring it to be haram, um, and a few others. Few people, uh, Dioban as well, yeah. Dioban actually w was really on this long time ago, um, saying that it's also uh, forbidden. Then we have some Islamic councils in Malaysia. We have a few people like Sheikh Joe Bradford, some other people who've said, no, it's actually halal as a, as a technology. Now, be careful, as a technology in terms of the transaction, okay? So what are the reasons why did they say it's haram? Comes down to these answers. Number one, they say that there's a risk of fraud. Uh, and you can cheat because there's no centralized surveillance. So you need to have centralized surveillance to protect risk of fraud. Number two, it can be used to fund terrorism. Number three, it helps, you know, it's easier to launder money, so it, it engages in money laundering. Number four, there's a high level of volatility, so it's always going up and down. So there's a lot of risk. This can potentially, this is gharar, uncertainty because of the high amount of risk and volatility. Number five, it's issued by an unknown body or an unknown group. So we don't know who who controls it? I mean, that's, that's a, I think, one of the poorest arguments because you don't need to know, control, it's, not, it's not controlled by someone, it's decentralized. So decentralized means it's not controlled by anyone specifically. Uh, number six, it has no tangible reality. We talked about that. And number seven, they say most countries don't accept it. So if they don't accept it and it's not recognized, then we should say it's prohibited. But then of course, what happens when it does become recognized? 
So then there's a fatwa change. So these are some of the uh, elements that, that people have said, for this reason it may be forbidden. Now this is talking about the concept of cryptocurrency using cryptocurrency. Now the idea, like I mentioned before, people have different reasons why they ask. So when we're talking about the selling or the purchasing or the trading or the mining of cryptocurrency, it may be permissible, it may be impermissible depending on all the Islamic laws that exist on currency speculation uh, and things like that. Okay, so basic principle on currency speculation and trading in currencies. This is from Forex's website. The basically they say that uh, currency exchange, currency exchange is permissible in Islam as long as there's no interest element involved in it, number one. Number two, it's made hand to hand or spot um, and there's ways to translate that depending on Islamic forex exchanges. And number three, that the exchanger has a valid reason to anticipate a probable profit based upon an analysis that does not rely upon the psychology of gambling. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? That means that a lot of people, they're speculating on the market and they're trading currencies and it's akin to gambling. Because they're trying to make a quick buck and trying to buy right now and they're trying to sell when it goes up a little bit. I, I didn't say it's gambling, I said it's akin to gambling. It's like gambling. So what ends up happening is the idea that Ibn Rushd mentioned about two things can cause, or four things he mentioned, but two main things, riba and gharar are intrinsic to a transaction which can cause it to be prohibited in Islamic law. Gharar means uncertainty. Part of uncertainty, and there's a whole chapter on it, but part of the uncertainty is involving in a certain type of speculation that relies on the psychology, this is a good phrasing because it's broad, relies on the psychology of gambling, which would cause it to be prohibited. A lot of that depends on the amount of information the person has, the intention that the person has, how long they plan on keeping it, what they plan on doing with, with it, and all of that stuff. So this is kind of a, um, a vague answer, but it gives you the overall principle of how it gets processed. And then a more clear specific answer really depends on circumstances, it depends on the volatility, it depends on other things, okay? So my personal recommendation, I mean, I'm not here to give economic advice, just so you know, but uh, if you're using it as a store of value and you're going to put your life savings into it, I would be very careful because it's not a very good store of value right now because of the volatility, but it's an amazing medium of exchange. And it's considered to be halal and there's no prohibited elements as a medium of exchange, then uh, that could, this is an emerging technology. There's a few more arguments, by the way. It uses a, a massive amount of electricity uh, to be able to process all of these transactions. So another argument has been made. There's absolute waste of electricity. Uh, the amount of electricity that it takes to process uh, bitcoins is like the entire country of Pakistan uses or the entire country of Ireland. That's a lot of electricity, right? Uh, the amount of kilowatts that it uses per, you know, per bitcoin. The thing, though, is you know, Bitcoin might go away, like I said. But the idea of cryptocurrency is being built upon, is being developed. Satoshi was the first one to come up with a solution to the double spending problem. But there are other people who are going to develop more efficient methods to you know, result in a similar type of uh, you know, benefit of, of having you know, deregulated, uh, decentralized currency. So from that perspective, uh, we shouldn't just shut the door quickly and we should see what other type of things are developing. Um, the last thing I'll say is that uh, when the internet was first developed, right, it was just designed to share documents with people. And look what the internet became now. Right? People are always very cautious and very careful when there's a new technology and it can be very scary. It has potential to do bad and it has potential to do good. So I think we as Muslims, um, we, should, um, we should be cautious, we should tread cautiously, but we should never close the door before we understand the real pros and cons of things because we might just, this may be the thing that Muslims have actually been looking for because we know that our 
economy is primarily based on interest. The entire world economy is based on interest. And we're pretty much one of the few religions left in the entire world or people left in the entire world who still say that, yeah, we shouldn't be taking interest or paying interest. And our money devalues and in order to, you know, be able to have some stable currency, we need some type of alternative in the system somehow. This may be that alternative to the system we're looking for, or it may not be. We don't know. We should be careful before we close the door, and people should just be cautious about it, inshallah. So this is uh, all I had to say about that, inshallah. Any questions? Yes, sister. You're right. So the criminal world is going to use this technology and they're going to use all other technologies to do the bad things that they want to do. So let me, let me respond to that by saying there are Muslims who are actually trying to do exactly what you're saying through blockchain technology. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to go back to the gold standard by using a cryptocurrency that is actually an asset backed by gold even. So there's so many things that are developing now in this field that we shouldn't, I think we shouldn't uh, close our, uh, our idea to what we're trying to achieve. So if you're saying we need to go back to the gold standard, this could potentially, the technology itself, not Bitcoin, the technology itself could potentially be a means to actually get people back to a more stable type of currency like the gold standard if that's what we're looking for. So just keep that in mind inshallah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So the thing is when it comes to stocks, if the stock is represented by something that's considered to be an asset, there's a difference between something that's considered to be a currency in Islamic law, right? And the reason is the rules of riba apply and other rules apply to it because they're viewed as different things. Now, when we're viewing something in Sharia, in Islamic law, we have to go back to not only the way that they're written, but their actual function. So if something is viewed, is called a commodity, but it functions like a currency, we should be viewing it as a currency and vice versa. Mm. Are you talking about for that specific in instance? Yes. Yeah. So I have not looked into those, so I can't give you an answer. So, well, so let me clarify. So I'm not saying that it turns into a gambling habit when you're trading cryptocurrency. What I'm saying is it's, it's not that it becomes a habit. It's the, when I said the mentality, so when it, when, it, when, it meant, when it said the mentality of gambling, it's not talking about the addiction of gambling. It's talking about the uncertainty of making a decision on a specific transaction, even if it's only one transaction. I just wanted to clarify that. So sorry, go ahead, continue. Right. So, it, so when it comes to the stock market, again, it comes, to it comes down to the function of how a stock is viewed versus how a currency is viewed in terms of what it, what it is and what its function actually is. There's a difference between what's viewed to be a commodity or a percentage share of ownership in a company which has a certain type of value versus a currency 
which doesn't actually have an actual intrinsic value that's tied back to a commodity. So let me clarify that. So uh, trading currency with the intention of making a profit becomes a gray area. It's a gray area. Now from that gray area, there's a lot of you know, discussion among scholars in terms of what causes it to become okay and what causes it to not be okay, right? So you know, I, unfortunately I can't go into the details of all of that because there's a lot of different opinions. It's just a very long thing. But the, the summary of all of that is it depends on the type and the amount of information that you have that you're using in order to make a decision on why you're buying this currency combined with partly your intention of why you're doing it in terms of you planning to just sell because you're hoping that it reaches a certain value and then you sell. These two things will determine whether you move from the gray area to the halal or to the haram. I hope that just narrows it down. I can't give you a clear-cut answer, but that just narrows it down for you. Inshallah. Yeah. Yes. So on the aspect of cryptocurrency, that classification is haram, it's illegal, some people say it's illegal. Um, what's the role of those simply just harming dollars that are being transferred by the dollar? That's, okay. Um, let me repeat the question for the camera. So among the principles among the cons of cryptocurrency that we mentioned which one of them are fundamental to the cryptocurrency that cannot be removed um, I see, I see, okay. But, but also, it seems that may, I mean, again, trying to go back, it's read across one of those that just simply cannot be moved at all. Is there any kind of footnote that There is, there is. There are some. So, for example, the, the risk of harm. The risk of harm that they come up with about, for example, money laundering and funding terrorism and things like that, um, risk of fraud, those things cannot be resolved. Um, they cannot be resolved for any currency because that risk is always going to be there, right? Even if you regulate Bitcoin exchanges in countries, the vast or, or cryptocurrency exchanges in a country, which I think there should be some amount of regulation, m most people are going to use cryptocurrency exchanges because of convenience. But you don't have to use cryptocurrency exchange. So in the criminal world, they can still get cryptocurrency without going through an exchange that exists in their own country. And therefore, they'll continue to transact with it. That is intrinsic to cryptocurrency technology, which cannot be removed from it. So that's one example of it. They can make it more difficult and just make it more of an inconvenience for people to go around there and get their own thing. But you can just, you can go on their website, you can establish your own, you know, Bitcoin wallet. The, the question is how are you gonna convert your dollars into cryptocurrency, right? If you wanted to, let's assume, you know, you were a criminal, and this is not like a wiki how explanation of how to be a criminal, but I'm just explaining to how it would work. If you wanted to be a criminal, which you should not be, what you do is you just go on online, you'd establish your own Bitcoin wallet without going through an exchange. You have your own, you know, you have your own, you know, uh, place where people can send you money and you find someone on the street or you find somewhere in a random part of the world who's willing to trade your cash on the street to transfer Bitcoin over to you on the spot and now you got Bitcoin or you got cryptocurrency in your wallet and you could do whatever you want with it. It's inconvenient, very inconvenient, um, but it can be done, right? So that's, not, that's in a way that reduces it because the more inconvenient you make it to go around exchanges, 
uh, the more protection you have. But then the problem is if you overregulate Bitcoin or cryptocurrency exchanges in your country, you've just removed the whole you know purpose of deregulation and removing the third party. You just threw the third party back in and you overregulated the third party. So it removes the benefits. So the more regulation you have, the more of the benefits you're going to lose. But then at the same time, people still use uh, you know Bitcoin exchanges and cryptocurrency exchanges because it's convenient. Because you want to just do a quick transfer and you want someone to store it for you and all of that. That's that's pretty much what it seems, but then all the other arguments about electricity and uh, things like that. And they c yeah, things that can be resolved. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah you're right. You pretty much. Yeah. In which aspect? You're talking about volatility of the price. You're talking about price volatility, right? Yeah. yeah, so a lot of scholars have said the price volatility. Now, if the price stabilizes, right, which it could eventually, right, then it'll. Re it's so the volatility of cryptocurrency is not intrinsic to the currency. It's because people are speculating on it. So you can potentially make another type of cryptocurrency. One of one of our friends, we were talking about it. If you if you tie it to something, or you you tie it to something that will be more stable, then you're not going to have the same amount of volatility. And there's a lot of Muslims actually right now, Muslim organizations that are working on something like this, that are trying to tie it to either some commodity or tie it to gold or have a minimum value to it, which is going to prevent the amount of volatility that it could potentially have. So what can happen? What I'm trying to say is this is kind of in line with his question is. Volatility is not intrinsic to cryptocurrency per se. It can be reduced or it can be, I don't know, maybe not eliminated, but it can be reduced to a significant thing and it's going to have to do with the trend, it has to do with the fact that it's new and all of that. No, 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 no. You don't need government control to be able to reduce the volatility of another cryptocurrency. That's not necessary per se. For zakah, zakatul mal in cryptocurrency. It's too difficult to cash out the amount in terms back into dollars. Like I said, a lot of poor people use uh, Bitcoin. So you could just give them Bitcoin as your zakah. They can go buy a meal from it. <laughs> How you find a poor person? <laughs> who, has a, who, has a, who has a Bitcoin wallet? What we'll do, you go to Uplift Charity, and what they'll do is they'll establish a Bitcoin wallet for the people on their list, they'll transfer Bitcoin over to them. Why not? Huh? Via Bitcoin? Uh, if there's a masjid that does accept Bitcoin, yeah, you can give it to either a relief organization or give it to a masjid that it does accept Bitcoin. IOC doesn't. Our university did at one point in time. We were accepting Bitcoin for our enrollments. If you ever want to register, you can pay us through Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> so, but uh, uh, we currently don't, but there might be. And if you, maybe if you go to um, Uplift Charity or Islamic Relief and say, hey, can you guys set up a quick Bitcoin transfer? It's not a difficult thing to do. I mean, I set it up on our website in 10 minutes. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that matters too, yeah. Okay, so good question. So the question is, you're asking if that's what happens? So, so, the, the, so this is the thing. So you're right. In a sense, when you convert, there's a third party involved in the conversion, right? But, but the transfer itself doesn't have a third party. So, so the, the question is, 
is once you've converted into the cryptocurrency, now you've eliminated third party. Who, who do you give that money to? The cryptocurrency to? To anyone who's willing to accept the cryptocurrency. Yeah. You, okay, let me give you an example, a very primitive example. Let's say you met Satoshi Nakamoto, okay? You met him on the street, and you say, look, Satoshi, I know you got a bunch of Bitcoins because you started this entire thing, right? I have $100. I'm going to give you this $100. You transfer into my Bitcoin wallet some Bitcoin worth $100 for, from you. You take that Bitcoin wallet that you have, and you have family back home. You tell them to open up a Bitcoin wallet for themselves, which costs nothing, and you send them Bitcoin. They're going to go, let's assume your family lives in Zimbabwe. They're going to go to the store and everyone in Zimbabwe is skeptical, for example, because what happened recently in their government. And you go, hey, man, I want to buy that apple from you. You know, you say, hey, do you accept Bitcoin? Of course I do. Better than the hundred trillion dollar you know, uh, Zimbabwe dollars that we had. And he'll go ahead and accept it from you. And you never need to convert it back to any type of local currency. So the only third, there's no third party. Because you met Satoshi on the street. The what? Yeah, Satoshi got the hundred dollars. Yeah. How did he get it? You give him the money. Yeah, you give him the money. You hand it to him. He's not a third party. He's second party. There's no third party overseeing your transaction. That's what the third party means. Right? No, no, I agree. So Satoshi, if he was smart, if he really believed in his own system, maybe maybe he wouldn't want your money, you know. So. <laughs> right. What? That's no. That's a question. So, it, what you what you what you're saying is basically, the cryptocurrency is not going to displace the currency that you 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 the currency fiat currency that you live in. Like it's not going to replace the American dollar. Right? Even though I have a quote from Ron Paul here, by the way. This is pretty interesting. Um, Ron Paul, anyone know who Ron Paul is? Okay, yeah, former congressman Ron Paul. He said, um, where'd it go? Oh, I lost his quote. Anyways, he says that uh, Bitcoin is going to like destroy the American dollar or something like that. That's not likely going to happen in the near future. Right? Most people say it's not likely going to happen, but this becomes an alternative currency that's used as an excellent medium of exchange. So yeah, it's not going to solve all the problems. It's not going to remove the entire system of dollar and you know banks and all of that stuff. They're not going to disappear because of this technology right now. Um, and if they did, it would actually be a problem because we don't have enough electricity <laughs> to, to actually <laughs> process all of that the Bitcoin transaction. Right. Um, so. Yeah, you're right in that sense, but it's a step in the direction of where they're trying to go. Okay, yeah, in the back. Yep. Yep. Sure. Mm. Mm. Right. 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 So the question is, how prevalent uh, has this become, and how many people are using it? So, I mean, you know, there, Microsoft is accepting Bitcoin. There are subway locations which accept Bitcoin. You could buy a subway sandwich there. You know, there are ATM machines where you can just withdraw. You know, you can actually get your Bitcoin right there. So it's becoming more and more prevalent as the days go by. Every year, there's going to be more and more people who are going to be accepting Bitcoin. So when you have major franchises and major corporations even accepting it, I think it's, uh, it's only going to be a few years before it becomes very, very common uh, to, be ex to be accepting that. Many websites now are integrating all the different type of cryptocurrency, uh, which unfortunately is always being exchanged back and forth. Uh, but it's being accepted by uh, 
a lot of mainstream companies in America and around the world. Okay. Uh, sisters stopped. They're done. Okay. I didn't look at the sister's side for a while. So anyone who has not asked the question yet, uh, anyone who has not asked the question yet, you've not asked the question. Who's paying for the electricity? The people who are running the computers. Why do they pay for the electricity? Because they get Bitcoin by mining. It's called mi like processing the Bitcoins gives them Bitcoins for now. That's it can offset, it can offset their costs because of Bitcoin value. The money, so right now, Bitcoin has not maxed out, so it's still being generated, meaning that it's being mined. It's not reached the maximum 21 million. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it offsets it. Nobody owns the system. Nobody owns this. Nobody owns the entire system. So you have a computer, you can set up and start mining Bitcoin on your home computer if you wanted to. You're not going to have very good processing power though compared to <laughs> people who have like an entire, you know, center of computers, you know, chained up and everything. And now they're putting it in like cold places like, you know, uh, Iceland and stuff like that because it automatically cools the system. Your, cool, your Southern California is not the best place to be generating a lot of heat and electricity. It's not going to help you very much. But... Uh, you could do it. You could participate. Like there was a program, you know, when I was in college, there was a program called SETI. Anyone know this program? S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Basically what we used to do when we were in the dorm is we would leave our computer on all night. And when we go to class and we leave our computer on at night too, you can sign up for your computer to be used by a centralized program to use the CPU processing power to be searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. I know that sounds weird and all that stuff right now, right? Uh, maybe with SpaceX now, it's not as weird. You know, Elon Musk trying to get to Mars. But you can use your computer and you can disconnect it anytime you want. This is old technology. Anyone ever use Torrent? Anyone use Torrent technology? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you what you used it for, you know? <laughs> but, but you use Torrent technology. It's the same thing. Torrents work the exact same thing. It's distributed. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of software piracy and video piracy and all of that, but how does it work? It's distributed, so all of you are uploading and you're downloading from different nodes across the network at the same time. It's not controlled by one specific person. It's distributed across, and so that's how it functions. Okay, you had a question. In principle, is it haram to invest in currencies? I answered this question technically. Is it haram to invest in currencies for speculation? The question is, what do you mean by speculation? Right? So there's three principles. One, there should be no riba involved when you're doing that trade because sometimes there's a delay. Right? Number two, it should be on the spot. It should be hand-to-hand. -hand. And number three, the, the type of speculation that you're doing and the type of information that you have available is what determines whether it's allowed speculation or not allowed speculation. Okay, so it's not that it's different, it's the same. So the ruling on investing in Brazil, Brazil's currency because you think the economy is going to change is the same ruling on investing in cryptocurrency. It's not that it's different. The question comes back down to what is the answer on that question? And there's a range of scholarly opinions. That's why I don't want to give you one specific thing uh, because I'm myself not fully decided on where exactly you draw the line here, but I can narrow it down to where this range of opinions fall. And the range of opinions fall, like I said, it falls within a range of the amount of information and the type of information, whether you have fundamental information or you have technical information of a lot of people are buying into this thing, therefore I'm gonna go buy into it, that's on the side of excessive speculation. If you actually have some type of more inside information about some, uh, Thing that's going on is happening and you want to get your own money out of your own currency because you think it's going to be going down and you decide to put it into another currency, this is not considered to be excessive gharar or excessive uh, uncertainty. 
And in between these two kind of extreme scenarios is a gray area. And that's where all the differences of opinion fall within that gray area. So that's all I can do for you now is hone it down. To learn more about that gray area. Yeah. I'll give you an update at Fajr, inshallah. <laughs> yes, brother, on the side, yeah. Inshallah, sure. Uh, who has not asked a question? You haven't asked a question? You want to add one more? That's considered riba, you know. If you <laughs> one more on top, <laughs> go ahead. It's always better to be safe if something is in the gray area. Yeah. Uh, you already asked the question. Who? You asked the question already? No, you did not. I will refer. Are we there yet, basically? Yeah. Okay. okay. So the question is, what is the prediction of Muslim scholars on the kind of the time where we have to run away to small villages and go on mountaintops like Hadith says? The prediction is that we're still far from that. We're not, we're, we're not there yet. So don't leave yet. Inshallah. <laughs> we, we don't know. We don't know when it's going to happen. So... But uh, they, scholars will notify you when it's time to leave, inshallah. <laughs> and you will see them leaving, inshallah. <laughs> uh, Zuhaib. Zuhaib in the back.
That's good. Let me just repeat that for the camera. So uh, Zuhaib was reminding us that when we put our money into a bank account, we're actually fueling the debt-based system because they're loaning that money out. So people are trying to be more socially conscious now. So this is something that we should, you know, keep in mind as well. In the back, all the way in the back. Yeah. <laughs> MashaAllah, like the go golden question of the night. <laughs> golden question of the night, alhamdulillah. Um, so some of the scholars who gave a fatwa on this, who kind of are high level in governments, I think that their political affiliations do affect their fatwas. Um, and then there are other ones who are not uh, directly affiliated with the government per se or under the control of a government. Um, and they, they came to similar conclusions without the government pressure. So I'll just, I'll say that, inshallah. Uh, yes, who has not asked a question? Anyone new want to ask a question? You, are, you already asked, you already asked. Okay. The reference for Satoshi's article, it's on his website. I think it's bitcoin.org or whatever. Just type Satoshi Nakamoto original paper. White paper, yeah, white paper, and you'll find it, yeah. It's a very interesting read, to be honest with you. Can you buy shares in companies and stuff? As, as, lo as long as the company is willing to transact with the cryptocurrency yeah I mean the, the thing is look cryptocurrency can do it can do things that normal currency can't do right you can do micro payments you you could pay someone you, you can't pay someone half a cent for example right with 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 cryptocurrency you can right so can you imagine like a world where um, instead of having an internet connection you know someone made this point instead of having internet connection or or even a cell phone connection while you drive around the, the moment you get next to a cell phone tower of uh, a different company, you don't have to sign up with one company. Every time you cross uh, a cell phone tower, they charge you for the amount of data that you're using exactly in front of that cell phone company, and they can take it right out of your, uh, you know, right out of your wallet, and you could pay a fraction of a payment uh, for something like that, depending on how much you use it, and it just keeps multiplying, right? Like this is, you know, these type of things cannot happen with the normal system that we have because of the transaction costs and the fees that are associated with it. So there's just so many potential uses for this technology that it could develop into. We're gonna see in a decade like where this can actually go. It's like today the internet, nobody thought the internet really would be like it is today, right? Like 20 years ago, no one could imagine that this is what's gonna happen with the computers and internet. And now you're like, wow. I'm telling you the same thing's gonna happen in 10 years with the technology. Not, nece not necessarily Bitcoin, but the technology, right?
Right, right. No, that's that's a good point. So there's the two two points I want to highlight. One is you said um, there's a difference between day trading and buying and selling these cryptocurrencies because you're trying to make a quick buck out of it, and a difference between someone who says, "Look, I know that this is the future. I want to, you know, put my money into this thing and just put it away for five years, and I know that it's going to be something big later on." So that's a very good, valid point. The second point that you mentioned about, you know, the importance of smart contracts with Ethereum and other technologies, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're opening the way for innovation and we're not stifling innovation. So I'll put this last point in here and then we'll stop. The idea of having individual scholars who are usually full-time imams, who are dealing with family counseling issues, who are sitting there talking about, you know, oh, my son is not listening to me and my daughter went off and got drunk or something like that. Scholars don't have very much time to focus on issues like this, which are extremely important, as you can see, because they're so distracted with so many other things. And one of the things is, we as a community, I would argue that as a Muslim community worldwide, we don't invest very much money and resources into Islamic research like we should. And this is part of the problem. So if you want sophisticated answers and you want sophisticated research, we need to change our mentality, understand that Islamic research councils need to be well-funded, need to be supported, need to be developed so that we have high-level capable scholars coming out with high-level, you know, in-depth research on issues like this. So until the mentality changes, we're just going to keep relying and hoping we have a few superheroes in the community that just come along and kind of solve all the problems for everyone. So I think we really need to think about what our personal individual role is in trying to solve this issue and trying to you know, create things for the future, inshallah. So jazakumullah khairan for that. When I close, you can, I'll stick around, you can ask me personally, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge and wisdom and practice. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth as truth and help us to follow it and show us the false as false as keep it and keep us away from it. I mean, subhanahu rabbi rabbil izzati yamma yusifun wa salamun ala al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please help with the chairs if we can get the chairs put away, inshallah.